The Sydney International Wine Competition is the only competition in the world where the wine is judged alongside food. The 2010 competition ran for five days in the World Heritage listed Blue Mountains, New South Wales, Australia. Our primary electorate is the consumer and so we've developed a system of judging wine in the final analysis for their compatibility with the food so that if you uh, can think of what you're going to uh, have to eat, be it a barbecue or a haute cuisine dinner, uh, we encourage people to also think about um, what sort of wine they would like to drink with that and help them make a, a wise choice by offering them a whole range of wines of that style. Within the 13 different style categories, there are three main phases to the competition. The first being a culling phase, where the cream of the entries is sorted out. This phase is judged by variety. And then the intermediate phase is where the wines that come through from the first phase are reassessed by the judges. And irrespective of variety, the wines are placed into a pallet weight continuum. Of course the wines are all being tasted blind so that they don't know what the variety is or where it's come from or how old it is or anything like that. Uh, it's just being assessed as a wine in the glass and uh, the judges shuffle these uh, samples backwards and forwards until they get a row of increasing palate weight. And then the chief judge uh, retastes them all. He's got a hard job in that respect. And uh, he decides, OK, that's where the lighter bodied dry reds finish and the medium bodied dry reds commence. I think that was more medium, isn't it? Yeah, top end of medium, I yep. Yep. The final phase is the re-judging of the wines that have been sorted into their style categories. The wines are judged firstly as wine and then secondly alongside food. The uh, panel leader calls for the food dish that has been uh, rehearsed and selected to accompany that particular style category. The judges then re-judge the wine after tasting a small morsel of the food to complex their palate. Um, in a way that it isn't complexed when they're just tasting the wine by itself. That then becomes the, um, the basis for determining the award winners. Um, we're not looking for what a wine might be in five years' time. We're looking for what the consumer can expect if he or she buys that wine today or in six months' time, so to speak. The logistics of the food preparation and presentation is a very important factor in this competition. The food needs to be put together quickly, without any last minute complication, and has to taste as good when it's cold as it does when it's hot. This is a great help for the kitchen staff, as well as for the judges, who don't need to allow for the temperature change when tasting the food. The food side of the competition is of course a very vital element. Both my wife Jackie and I come from a food background and that's a great help. We've been thinking about and practicing the use of wine as a complement to the dining table for many years. We know that a lighter body dry red is going to require a certain type of dish and so uh, the process is very simply that we continuously review throughout the year uh, other people's recipes until we come across an idea that uh, takes our fancy. And then we will rehearse and modify and tweak that uh, particular recipe until it meets the requirements. The other thing is that it's got to be a largely homogenous uh, dish in the sense that it doesn't have half a dozen different flavours and different parts of the dish that's on the plate. So that that of course is to ensure that uh, each tiny morsel that they take in, and chew and ingest, uh, gives the same uh, profile in the palate as it was the case for the previous wine and the one before that, etc. Another important logistic is the movement of the wine from the storage facility to the judge's tasting mat. In this respect, there is a lot of work that goes on before the judges arrive. The storage facility has uh, specially designed shelving units 
each of which, on five different shelves, carries a hundred uh, entries, five bottles of each of a hundred samples. And long before the judges arrive, every one of those wines is marked off against the total entries list with its exact rack and shelf number. So that if a bottle is required for a repour, any judge at any time can ask to have a look at a, a fresh sample of a particular wine. And uh, it's vital that uh, in those circumstances, the stewards can go straight to the spot and collect that wine without any delay and bring it forward so that within five minutes at most, the judge has the new sample that he has requested. I make sure the wine gets into the glass and I also uh, have a, a team that makes sure it's the absolute correct wine in the correct glass that's going to the correct judge because of the system between the warehouse where they check it and the system where my team, the pouring team, checks it again before we pour it. We don't make mistakes. Each uh, judge has a tasting mat, they call it, and the wine is placed on the square that has a number in that square. It's a blind tasting as far as the judges are concerned, but we know that the wine that is situated in the position, say, number two on any tasting map, with a foolproof level of accuracy, that that is the correct wine that's being presented to the judges. Each judge is given a small portable tape recorder for the duration of the competition, and after each bracket of wines, the judges find a quiet spot in the garden to dictate the notes they have taken. The tapes are then subsequently transcribed and then appear on the competition website. The judges keep notes during their judging and one of the surprising things that they discover is that uh, often the mark that they've given the wine after they've tasted it with food is different, either higher or lower than it was when they tasted it or judged it, assessed it just as wine. The panel of six or seven judges judge independently, without discussion, and their aggregate marks are tallied on the computer. And the wines with the highest aggregates are the award winners with a trophy presented to each style category. The interesting thing is that hardly ever do you find a wine that achieves unanimous approval from all of the judges. The wine is there with its award because of the majority of the judges uh, having put it there with their total aggregate. We publish the, um, the dissenting judge. He doesn't have to argue with the other judges about his point of view, nor they with him or her, but we let the public see that uh, if they don't particularly find a, uh, an award-winning wine agreeable, there's probably a judge in the panel that agrees with them. And in other words, there's no such thing as a single unanimous opinion that meets all requirements for everybody about any single wine. It's always a matter of uh, a personal choice and that's the competition's main aim, to encourage people to think about the wine intelligently and not just plonk a bottle on the table and everyone dives in and fills up their glass. Once you start to think of wine as a complement to food, then it has a whole lot of beneficial social advantages and implications. So the whole idea is to engage uh, consumers in the, uh, the wondrous world of, of wine and it'll greatly heighten their, um, their pleasure once they know a little bit more about what they're doing and why they're doing it and not just drinking. Mm -hmm.